so yeah, I'm uh, Fiona Sampson. I'm from the University of Sheffield, the Centre for Urgent and Care uh, Research, Urgent and Emergency Care Research, sorry. Uh, and I'm going to present the findings from um, a study that we did um, in uh, conjunction with people from Yorkshire Ambulance Service, West Midlands and East Midlands. Um, I put the project management group, this is very much a, a group effort, I'm just presenting it. So I'm going to talk about um, the study, the wider study, uh, which is around how pre-alerts are used and very much sort of what current practice is. But also think about how um, things should be improved. Um, now, some people say that you shouldn't give recommendations from research. So what I'm saying is this is what we found and hopefully it's over to a policy makers to make, make changes. So um, just try and move the slides on in a minute. Okay, so a bit of background. Uh, so I'm, you know, teaching grandmas kegs, a pre-alert call. Everyone knows what a pre-alert call is, but I just thought I'd put in the definition from the um, 2020 Arkem ACE joint guidance. Um, so pre-alerts are used by ambulance clinicians where they judge that the patient needs a uh, different or special response um, upon arrival at the ED. And the use of pre-alerts has increased significantly over the past decade. Um, and there's evidence of improved outcomes for pre-alerted patients in specific patient pathways. So, for example, um, stroke, STEMI, um, trauma. However, outside of these limited pathways, there's very little information about how pre-alerts should actually be used or the value of pre-alerts. Very little research. So we worked with the ambulance services to address a service-led research problem concerning uncertainty around how pre-alerts should be used um, and the potential sort of conflict and incivility that arises from inappropriate use of pre-alerts and concerns particularly about uh, overuse of pre-alerts leading to pre-alert fatigue in the emergency department. Um, so I'll not go on too long about the methods, but this was a large study. It had uh, several work packages and we triangulated data from all of the different work packages. Um, I'll briefly talk you through each of them. Uh, so the first thing we did was we mapped um, UK ambulance service guidance. So we asked all of the different ambulance services for their pre-alert guidance and we looked at what was in it uh, and compared it all to the, the national guidance. Uh, we analysed routine data, so we analysed 12 months worth of ambulance conveyance data from three uh, UK ambulance services um, to understand pre-alert practice. Um, and our final data set included 1.3 million anon anonymised electronic patient records. We linked these with routine hospital statistics on um, queues at ambulance services, clinician personnel, so uh, experience, length of experience, and also shift information to understand whether there was any difference uh, in sort of pre-alert behaviour at the end of shift like some people uh, were suggesting. Um, and we use logistic regression to explain whether there was variation in pre-alert practice, looking for which patient, clinician, hospital factors may affect practice. We also interviewed um, ambulance clinicians, so paramedics, EMTs, specialist paramedics um, within these three ambulance uh, services. And to improve the generalizability of findings, because we were only speaking to three ambulance services, we did an online survey, which some of you may have taken part in, of ambulance clinicians um, across, the, across the country um, in May, June this year. And we ended up getting tantalizingly close to th uh, 1,300 completed responses, which we were delighted with. Um, we also spoke to people at the uh, emergency departments. So we did semi-structured interviews with 40 emergency department staff. So this is me medical staff, nursing staff, but also um, roles such as HALOs. So um, ambulance um, clinicians working within the uh, emergency departments. And we did this within six emergency departments across these three ambulance services. So within each of the ambulance services, we spoke to people at uh, a major trauma centre and a trauma unit within each area. We also undertook uh, non-participant observation. So this is where we went in and we watched what happened in these emergency departments. So we watched pre-alerts being made. We spoke to people while they were doing, we tried to sort of understand what was going on and, and how these sort of pre-alerts were being communicated. Um, the one thing we were unsuccessful with, unfortunately, was um, patient recruitment. So we were hoping to speak to a small number of patients who'd been pre-alerted, but for various reasons, uh, we were unable to do this. Uh, but we had very good patient public involvement uh, group. So we had we did have input from patients um, who gave us advice throughout the project. So um, we identified a number of shared 
uh, areas of shared understanding. But we understand, we also identified significant variation in many of the factors. And I'm going to talk to you quite a bit about this variation because the variation is actually really key um, to understanding why there were, um, I guess, incivility and, and problems between communicating between ambulance and ED um, staff. So this very busy slide, um, too long didn't read message, uh, is that there were significant differences in the format, the accessibility and the scope of pre-alert guidance between the different ambulance services. So there were differences in thresholds and definitions of physiological criteria, even for really commonly pre-alerted conditions. So for example, stroke. Uh, in the survey, ambulance clinicians reported that local ambulance guidance was the most commonly used support in making pre-alert decisions. Uh, so two thirds said that they always use their local ambulance service guidance followed by uh, JR Calc. Uh, but only a third said they always or usually use the, the national guidance, with one in five saying that they never used it. And this variation the guidance used uh, is really important in understanding sort of how pre-alert decisions are made and how, you know, uh, variation uh, practiced. Um, so we looked at pre-alert rates uh, and patient factors. So um, one in 10 of the conveyances um, were pre-alerted within our routine data. But this varied between 8% and 15% by service. So there were different um, pre-alert practices across different services. Uh, and we did look into whether this was um, due to differences in recording, but it looked like it was a, a, a real problem. <laughs> um, so whilst the majority of pre-alerts were mapped to kind of pre-alertable conditions such as stroke or suspected sepsis, over half were due to less clear criteria such as unspecified medical conditions or other respiratory conditions. Um, there was evidence of differential understanding of what conditions needed pre-alerting. So, for example, in the survey, 75% of the uh, of people said that they would always pre-alert for cardiac or respiratory uh, arrest. Two thirds said they'd pre-alert for un unconscious with GCS of less than four. But only one in five for tachycardia bigger than 131. So there's significant variation in how much people would always pre-alert for these conditions. So obviously there's other factors involved. Um, Within interviews, certain conditions were considered to be more complex and needing further clarity within guidance. So sepsis was um, highlighted as an area of concern due to low thresholds in some protocols leading to high numbers of potentially inappropriate pre-alerts. Uh, and this was an area that was felt to sort of uh, create potential pre-alert fatigue in emergency departments. Silver trauma was highlighted as an area where ambulance clinicians wanted further guidance uh, and where emergency department clinicians reported potential under alerting practice. And there were differences between ambulance services and the proportion of ambulance clinicians who actually wanted further guidance, uh, which probably reflects differences in protocols across uh, different ambulance services. And throughout, people commonly talked about your barn door pre alerts. These are the easy ones, the ones that you know what to do, and when you phone them in, they know. That they need pre-alerting but there are also a lot of these sort of gray area pre-alerts that the the unclear the borderline cases where one person may pre-alert and another won't so there's clinical judgment required but also experience and this is where we look at other factors that are involved in decision making so hospitals uh was a was a key factor so interestingly the regression analysis qualitative interviews and the survey free text comments all identified that the hospital being conveyed to had a significant impact on pre-alert decision so this graph this is just one of the ambulance services it shows the odds ratios of pre-alert by receiving hospital showing that there are significant differences in the likelihood of uh, pre-alerting across different hospitals across all three uh, across the ambulance services that weren't explained by different hospital characteristics so it wasn't just that major trauma centers were all being pre-alerted whereas others weren't uh, and this is all adjusted for the case mix so pre-alerts um, were more likely when there was a longer anticipated handover delay at the receiving hospital um, and this may be explained by ambulance clinician concerns about their ability to look after a potential deteriorating patient in the back of an ambulance and concerns uh, that the patient might deteriorate and, and need seeing quicker. So even though they weren't actually ill at, you know, well, in need of a cr critical call at the time. Um, this was also influenced by different processes at different emergency departments for managing patients who weren't pre-alerted. So some uh, emergency departments, they'd happily, what, what we describe as eyeballing, <laughs> delightfully, uh, a patient. So 
they they come and have a look, uh, regardless of whether being pre-alerted. So it might not match as much if they didn't pre-alert at some hospitals. Observation interviews identified significant differences in pre-alert protocols between hospitals. Um, so, for example, some people expected fracture neck ephema to be um, pre-alerted, whereas other, others wouldn't and would get frustrated. Why are you calling in with a fracture neck ephema? Um, but there are also significant differences in anticipated response by clinicians. So ambulance clinicians reported that different hospitals had different expectations of pre-alert. They had different protocols for who is pre-alerted, but also different thresholds for discussion of unclear cases or advice calls on the phone. So some hospitals, they could phone up and have a chat, other places they couldn't. And this also varied between clinicians, which led to confusion. And this variation leads to concerns amongst ambulance crews about the response or reaction they get when they arrive. So making that decision about whether to pre-alert takes into account all of these factors. And this is probably particularly the case when conveying to a hospital outside of their usual area. So I've just put some quotes in there from sort of illustrating what the points I'm just making. So moving on now um, to uh, clinician factors. So um, pre-alerts were described as a skill, an art, <laughs> and pre-alerts of practice appears to be affected by role uh, and length of experience. So newly qualified uh, paramedics particularly being more likely to pre-alert. And the qualitative analysis suggested that pre-alert practice is affected by confidence, risk tolerance, so an understanding of, of the um, likely risk of a deteriorating patient, an experience, so pattern recognition, knowing what's, what's happened in the past, and knowing what to do, uh, with clinicians suggesting that experience has also enabled them to understand when protocols need to be adhered to strictly, but when their, their own sort of clinical gestalt, their own clinical judgment could overawe them. So clinicians were also impacted by feedback from emergency department staff, sorry, ambulance clinicians were, uh, and they reported taking previous emergency department response to pre-alert calls into account when deciding whether to pre-alert. So if they phoned in before with a pre-alert and said, what do you phone this for? That would make them think twice another time. Similarly, they would sometimes, if they'd phone in and they'd say, oh, just go to the normal queue, they might think, mm, well, that might not have needed a pre-alert. Established relationships between ambulance clinicians and emergency department staff helped build trust in pre-alert calls. Um, so these sort of relationships helped uh, understand whether, you know, these, these calls were uh, build an understanding of which people needed um, pre-alerting. But it also, unfortunately, sometimes led to judgments of clinicians who were perceived to over-alert. So I'll just let you read those quotes. Um, moving on to more cheerful things, areas of shared understanding. Well, um, despite many areas of variation, where there was variation in practice, which could lead to confusion, there's a, a definite level of shared understanding between emergency department ambulance clinicians, who we spoke to and who took part in the survey. So pre-alerts were seen as a key part of the chain of emergency care, key to enabling emergency departments to prepare and to improve patient care. There was a joint understanding also that the current context, the current waiting times and demand is exacerbating the importance of pre-alerts um, due to lack of resources uh, and the implications of long ambulance waits on potentially deteriorating patients. But also potentially increasing demand by increasing the number of people calling in for advice or concern about patients who may have to wait in the queue. Now, both um, emergency department staff and um, ambulance clinicians spoke about the pressures that they were aware that the other side was experiencing. So there was some awareness that this was a difficult situation. Pre-alerting is difficult for both sides. Um, understanding the difficulties of trying to look after a patient alone in the ambulance, uh, you know, for the ambulance clinicians, whereas the ED staff are trying to juggle high numbers of high acuity patients, finding room for pre-alerted patients, moving people around within their own departments. Um, and there's also recognition, again, from both sides that uh, some patients were barn door and some fell in sort of the grey area where the observations reported didn't necessarily match the concerns of the ambulance clinician. And I'll come to that later. But we also identified a number of areas that were sources of tension and frustration, um, potentially leading to incivility and sort of, you know, frustrations in, the, in these pre-alert conversations. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is what is a pre-alert? And this was something that kind of really surprised us when we were doing the analysis because 
it wasn't something we thought about. We thought it's the definition of a pre-alert. It's, you know, it's right up there in the guidance. But actually, we realised that there was confusion or some sort of lack of consistency understanding what a pre-alert is and particularly what the red phone, as we call it, should be used for. So we identified that although there was a shared understanding that pre-alerts were of value, there was variation in understanding of what a pre-alert is, its purpose and the anticipated response to pre-alert. And this variation was identified uh, between clinicians within particular services and settings, but also between clinicians within each ambulance service and within each emergency department. And we identified um, a kind of typology of pre-alert understandings that influenced ambulance clinicians' expectations of an emergency department response to their core. So um, these include information provision calls. So this is where the ambulance service is phoning in. They've got specific expectations of response. I'm calling, I'm informing the emergency department about, about a patient who needs a specific response. This is usually a bed and recess. Other clinicians did calls, information provision calls, but had no specific expectation of response. So they felt they were handing over the information to the emergency department, but the emergency department would, would decide what should happen to that patient. They had no expectation of what should happen. There were also increasing numbers of pr protocol-driven courtesy calls, as we call them. So this is where they're calling because there's an expectation to call. This is often due to ambulance service pre-alert criteria, but there's no actual clinical concern immediate clinical concern from the ambulance crew so they had no specific response it was just like we're phoning because we should there were also what we describe as heads up calls um this is where they provided information about a patient who may not require a specific response immediately so they may be at risk of deterioration but not at immediate risk of needing um specific a different response but ambulance clinicians had concerns about deteriorating particularly uh if there were long waits to be seen in the emergency department and finally, advice calls, information or clarification about how to manage the patient. This could sometimes be uh, where to uh, take the patient to, um, so which hospital, or and this often related to trauma calls. Um, but crucially, frustrations arose where the emergency department response didn't match the expectations um, of, emergency, of ambulance staff. And ambulance staff frequently discuss the sort of the success or acceptance of a pre-alert when the patient was brought into resource or failed where, where, where a specific response wasn't given. And this perception of acceptance or rejection impacted on future decision making, as I mentioned earlier, particularly in the absence of other feedback or where feedback was per perceived as rejecting the ambulance staff's clinical autonomy and judgment. In contrast, emergency department uh, described how acceptance or rejection, as we call it, of the pre-alert, i.e. the response they gave, come to uh, resource or go elsewhere, was principally driven by resource availability, so bed capacity staff, and particularly the number of patients requiring a resource bed at the time of the call, rather than disagreement with the, the ambulance clinician's assessment of the patient. So one patient may get a pre-alert at one time, but half an hour later, they might be sent to the front door. It's not because that pre-alert shouldn't have happened. It's because they didn't have the resources at the time. But this wasn't always understood. Uh, and EDA staff really value the uh, pre-alert information and helping them to manage flow uh, and, and prioritisation within the department, even when pre-alerts weren't admitted to resource. And they didn't perceive these to be failed pre-alerts. They valued them preferring to be informed in advance of anticipated demand for more time critical patients, even at short notice. And this was an er another area of slight frustration where um, even if they just had two minutes notice, it at least enabled them to feel sort of psychologically prepared or, or work out what they were going to do. But crews often didn't go, didn't call in because they said, oh, well, you know, we were on our way. We weren't far, in, far away. And pre-alerts enabled emergency department staff to prepare psychologically as well and plan for the patient's arrival, even when they were unable to make practical changes due to lack of resources. And we, we observed this happening. So when they were too full to be able to do anything, but they could work out what they were going to do and it helped them feel a slight sense of control that they wouldn't have when people just turned up. Um, generally, obviously there was variation, but generally ED staff explained more concern about under-alerting of patients than over-alerting but also recognise that responding to pre-alert calls potentially impacted current emergency departments, uh, patients, which had some potential risk, and also could create additional stre stress in already stretched departments, particularly where pre-alert calls were more advice-focused. 
So there's a kind of need to reframe how pre-alerts are perceived and, and get out of this idea that there's a such a thing as a, a failed pre-alert. So I'm going to talk now a bit about communication. Um, I think this was in the headline, so I thought I'd better, better touch on it. So uh, again, sorry to keep bleating on about variation, but there was significant variation. Um, so there were different ways of making pre-alerts led to different issues. So for our survey respondents, calls were made either directly to the emergency department um, from the crews or via an ambulance control centre. Uh, sometimes it, this is um, uh, a variety. So some places they would, um, you know, for trauma, they'd use a, a trauma desk, but not for medical staff. And this could lead to information. Um, or, yeah, so using ambulance control centres could lead, uh, lead to information not being passed on, Chinese whispers, details being lost. Now, within our fieldwork sites, um, we we actually only um, the ambulance services we spoke to and went into uh, had mainly crew on scene um, direct ED model. So we didn't actually get to observe um, or get any qualitative or observational data on calls via ambulance control desks. Um, but we are doing that in another project, the uh, major tra trauma triage tool that Gordon Fuller's running at the moment. So I could give you detail about that at a later date. Um, almost half the calls were undertaken uh, with personal mobiles, which we found a surprising finding. So people talked about using their phones because the work ones weren't good enough, they, they were less reliable, the service wasn't as good. But this had implications, of course, of being able to uh, record or have audit trails. And we observed practical communication uh, problems, due, including loss of signal, radio interference uh, leading to repeated calls. Also, crews conveying to the wrong emergency department due to phoning the wrong number and the emergency department not actually stating who they were during the call. So not picking up the phone and saying who they were. Different processes for managing pre-alerts uh, coming in meant that information could be lost or not passed on to the correct personnel within the emergency department. Uh, so information could be passed on either via handing over the pre-alert form, which sometimes the emergency department would just pass it to staff in resource, explain what needed to happen. Sometimes it was just verbal communication of the information. And particularly when patients weren't brought into resource, this information was more likely to go missing. Uh, so sometimes it was just poorly documented, sometimes it just wasn't filed and it just went off the radar. Emergency departments similarly had different informal policies for answering the phone. Uh, for some, they said, no, it's always the senior clinician. It's always the consultant in charge. Um, it's the nurse coordinator. For some, it's like just whoever's nearest, as long as it gets answered. Um, and the red phone was prioritised. When it rang, it got answered. When the red phone um, was answered by more junior or less experienced staff, however, this sometimes required senior clinicians to come and check uh, and re resulted in a delay in passing on the ED response to the ambulance clinician. And both ambulance and ED clinicians saw the value of efficient, concise pre-alerts um, as they enabled staff to return to direct patient care. Observations and interviews identified that the ringing of the red phone created interruptions in the emergency department. Uh, they required often senior staff to leave tasks uh, to pick up the phone. And there were periods where the emergency department, when, when we were observing, had to had to manage uh, repeated calls within a short space of time. So it did, these calls do put pressure on emergency departments. Um, similarly, ambulance clinicians expressed concerns when they were unable to get through to the pre-alert line, impacting on their patient care. Um, and ambulance clinicians described the difficulties in making a pre-alert call when they were often alone in the back of an ambulance, travelling at speed, trying to stabilise a sick or deteriorating patient. So pre-alerts weren't risk-free for anyone. Um, there's a joint recognition that calls needed to be concise and quick. Um, but both ambulance clinicians and ED staff expressed frustration at the perception of calls being extended unnecessarily by the other party. So ambulance clinicians... Um, uh, we're, we're upset at, um, you know, talked about ED clinicians constantly interrupting them and not let, letting them speak. Emergency department clinicians uh, talked about ambulance clinicians waffling on and, you know, just giving unstructured information that wasn't that, uh, wasn't that in, in, um, useful. So, sorry about the busy slide here. Um, the, yeah, so, the, so there were frustrations, uh, either through interruptions or through lack of structure, making it difficult to identify relevant information. 
And this happened particularly when there's a lack of shared understanding of the information required and concerns that excess or irrelevant information was being provided or requested. So there was this problem with ha not having a lack of consistency in how the pre-alert was commu communicated on the phone and this lack of shared language. Um, so communication was a key area of conflict and uncertainty, often due to different expectations of how the information should be structured. Pre-alert documentation varied between emergency departments, observed, uh, and the surveys indicated significant differences in how ambulance clinicians communicated pre-alerts. So a third stated that they always used ASMIS, ATMIS, the, the mnemonics ATMIS, DOSH, ICE, SBAR, um, you know, with a pre-alert. But 15% that they, they always provided observations, but without following any sort of fixed format. Um, within the six emergency departments that we absorbed, they all had different documentation. They all asked for observations, but in different order. Uh, they had different extra um, fields that they asked for. So you can see how this would be confusing for ambulance services that cover different emergency departments. Um, and differences in understanding what information needed to be conveyed, conveyed during the call led to frustrations and interruptions. So use of different checklists or formats between emergency department and ambulance clinicians led to tensions where the expectations of information or the order in which the information was given were not aligned. And ED's uh, staff valued having the information they required in the right order, particularly with an early understanding of the clinician concerned, uh, concern. So why, what was it about this patient that's made them phone? When they didn't get the information clearly and quickly, they would then probe and ask questions. Now, while some ambulance clinicians perceived questions as helping them stay on track and make the call briefer, interruptions and questioning was more often perceived as disruptive, questioning their clinical competency and importantly, de delaying transport or treatment by making the call go on for longer. Emergency department clinicians valued being given a specific reason for the call at the outset. So this is this headline concern. Uh, they really valued an accurate arrival time. Um, but this this specific reason for the call enabled them to frame the pre-alert mentally. But there was recognition from um, across the board that the, this, this specific reason didn't always match with the observation-driven handover formats and pre-alert protocols. Um, so observations are recognised to be only part of the picture. And there's this need for this headline that outlines the main concern. It may help direct the process, particularly when somebody just doesn't look right but yet the observations are okay. And this came through time after time and throughout from the ED and the ambulance service. So in interviews, um, ambulance clinicians emphasise that they valued being listened to, the clinical judgment being taken seriously, not being interrupted during pre-alert calls. Within the survey, only one in 10 ambulance clinicians felt that ED staff always listened and took the call seriously, um, listened to them without interrupting and always made appropriate arrangements in the ED. Now, within observations, two thirds of the pre alerts, so we looked at, we, we observed 143 pre alerts coming in. Two thirds of those were accepted into resource or high care beds, uh, which some places had where they had very few resource beds. For the remainder, they were told to go to the usual ambulance queue, um, so, or sent to another part of the emergency department, or brought in for some sort of senior clinical assessment. And sometimes the emergency department clinicians on the phone sometimes just provided a response okay, go to the front door pit stop or whatever they called it. But sometimes they explained that there was no room in recess at the moment. I can't get you in recess. If you go to the front door, um, we might be able to assess you when you get there. Giving a bit of reassurance and a bit of context uh, that helped the ambulance clinician understand why they'd made that decision and that it wasn't a rejection. So moving on uh, briefly, I'm just looking at the time. Yeah, I'll let's talk a bit quicker. Uh, training and feedback. So. Really interestingly, both emergency department and ambulance clinicians uh, reported a lack of specific training on how to undertake or receive pre-alert calls. And they generally expressed a need for training. Um, so the use of pre-alerts has been kind of organic. It's developed. It's not something that's um, where there's sort of good practice guidelines have built up over the years, um, with the exception of sort of some of the, some of the local and the national gu uh, guidance. So people describe physically learning on the job. Watching pre-alerts take place from senior mentors or colleagues, uh, ambulance clinicians learning and understand who to pre-alert as they gained experience. Uh, in the survey, most people said they learned on the job from colleagues, although nearly 30% said they received some specific training, but we don't know what this included. Um, similarly, ED staff reported very little training. 
Um, and learning from colleagues is fine if colleagues are all doing the same thing. If they're not, then this sort of ad hoc uh, um, training can cause problems. And importantly, uh, ambulance clinicians' views and survey findings both identified a lack of feedback on pre-alert decisions, with 45% stating they'd never had feedback, 28% um, saying they had feedback from ED staff or colleagues, uh, and 13% from managers or supervisors. But figures varied vastly across the ambulance services. Most clinicians who said they'd received feedback found it useful. But a lack of constructive feedback about appropriateness of pre-alert decisions or about how the, um, how the communication was made, or reasons for AD staff decisions not to admit a patient to resource, for example, may lead ambulance clinicians to be over-influenced by negative or unintended feedback. So this could include witnessing eye rolling by emergency department staff when picking up the red phone or, or receiving perceived negative response to pre-alert calls. With most ambulance clinicians stating that they learned how to pre-alert based on experience, this lack of positive or informative feedback may impact their uh, confidence to make pre-alert decisions and future pre-alert behaviour. So finally, um, I'm going to touch on guidance and support as areas where uh, improvements are needed. So as discussed before, differences in protocols and guidance between ambulance services and different emergency departments led to difficulties in understanding who to pre-alert and um, potential conflict when ambulance service guidance didn't align with ED guidance. Um, and this may be particularly difficult for less experienced clinicians who may stick to guidance more rigidly, and yet who didn't have the trust of local emergency departments when, when calling in pre-alerts. There's also a need um, for support in decision-making and variation support provided between ambulance services and between uh, emergency departments. So in some emergency departments, they're happy to provide advice over the phone, um, or opportunities for senior clinical review. So, you know, just pop in at the front door or, yeah, we'll pop out and see when you come in. Uh, but this didn't happen everywhere. So some emergency department staff felt that advice should be provided by the ambulance service to reduce variation pre-alerts and reduce burden on the ED, whereas others felt quite happy to provide this, um, provide this advice. But there was a recognition that there's a need for something as an alternative to the red phone because of the, the pressures um, and the, the sort of, um, yeah, the, the the number of the sheer volume of pre-alerts that were being dealt with, um, and there was a suggestion that ambulance staff may need an alternative pre-alert pre call on a more standard basis, uh, particularly for for borderline cases. So just I'll just talk through a sort of summary. So staff in both services highlighted the need for greater knowledge of each other's criteria protocols. And a desire for more consistency between the services as a route to improving understanding and communication and facilitating the, um, the pre-alert process. So there was widespread variation in practice, widespread variation that wasn't explained by case mix. In particular, emergency departments um, not being informed of ambulance service changes in pre-alert criteria could lead to tension in the interaction between individuals uh, when alerting and receiving pre-alerts. Um, and some interview participants expressed a desire that criteria should be co-produced or developed with in input from both services. So we need to bring together uh, an understanding of how um, pre-alerts happen. And this, you know, to a degree uh, has, has already been done with the development of the ACE and the ARCAN crit uh, criteria. Um, there was also a desire for more standardisation between ambulance service and emergency departments of formats and documentation for communicating and recording pre-alerts. Um, ambulance clinicians also highlighted the need for greater clarity and some protocols and guidance in some instances, so some, con uh, some conditions. Protocols are seen as valuable, particularly for newly qualified and experienced um, clinicians and could help clarify decision making, reducing variation, but also um, not always, uh, I guess, welcomed in balance because of the the use of clinical gestalt and, and sort of clinical understanding. Um, but there were limitations to guidance, so not, not taking contextual factors into account and, and also sometimes increasing the time made, uh, taken to make a decision. And many clinicians highlighted the balance between protocols and experience and how experience can inform interpretation of the guidance or even lead to uh, overriding it. 
problems arose also due to the sort of all or nothing nature of the pre-alert. So you can either call the red phone or you can't. And there's a lack of alternatives to calling this red phone. So when unsure whether to pre-alert, ambulance commissions sometimes just want to discuss the case of the ED or with a, a senior, ambu- uh, senior clinician, whether this is from the ambulance service or the emergency department. And the lack of alternative support mechanisms could lead to frustrations where emergency departments didn't have the capacity to deal with these advice calls. Um, and importantly, improved ways of communication, using these headline findings, explaining the response, making things simpler, um, but particularly probably getting hold of some sort of joint documentation so that everyone can be literally reading from, from the same page. So what next? Well, we, we did a workshop, which I didn't mention earlier. We did a workshop. We had, uh, I think, 28 people come from uh, ambulance and EDs and um, some uh, policy makers. And we fed back the findings and had a discussion about how we can actually take this in, uh, into sort of be used in real life. And we had a few suggestions. So one was um, developing some sort of community of practice to identify areas of good practice. So this is where people have questions and, you know, oh, we've done this, we've actually developed this shared guidance or we've we've got a halo in uh, who, which really helps us uh, give advice to ambulance clinicians. Um, we're also going to develop some infographics to summarise some of the key findings and we'd be uh, really keen to hear what, what findings you think need to go into these infographics. Um, but there's also implications for decision makers. So, you know, developing some sort of shared documentation that's useful for everyone that uses um, uses these mnemonics. Because another thing about the mnemonics that we noticed was that people used uh, had very personal preferences. So some people were like, "Oh yes, I always use S bar. It's, it's my favourite, regardless of whether they should actually be using S bar or at list on that patient or whatever." Um, there's also a need for some simple, brief shared training. Um, it was suggested that this could be sort of part of, of handover um, training, uh, because at the moment there's not a lot going on about pre-alerts. Um, some of the core principles to be included in the revised um, ACE RCM guidelines, and also some need to uh, review senior clinician uh, clinical advice mechanisms for ambulance clinicians. And just briefly at the end then, so acknowledgements, a uh, massive, massive thank you to everyone who took part in the research. So we had 70 interviews with ambulance and ED staff. We had all uh, nearly 1,300 um, ambulance clinicians filling the survey. We had research departments helping recruit people. None of this could have gone ahead with them, and they're all incredibly busy people. <laughs> and the emergency departments were phenomenally busy and crowded, as you all know. Uh, so yeah, huge thank you to everyone who took part. Um, also, the, we had a um, March Chapel Clerical Sport Project Advisory Group gave us independent oversight throughout, uh, and the NIHR program who funded it. Um, and I'll just leave my email up there. If anybody, if anybody has any ideas, feedback, anything you think we should do, anything you want to do, then prealerts at sheffield.ac.uk. Um, let us know.